it's important that the system functions properly. It's a very dangerous situation if, if, they're, if they're interpreting rules that they don't understand. Smart city, what is it about? A livable city, how do we create it? Thank you so much for giving your valuable time to listen to Urbanistica podcast season number two. I am Mustafa Sharif, an urban planner, and you're more than welcome to join my big journey of exploring the making of smarter and more livable cities. Don't forget to follow Instagram account to see the stories behind the scenes and also subscribe the YouTube channel to see the live talks. Let's get in touch on LinkedIn, share your reflections with us, with Urbanistica community, recommend the podcast to people you think are interested in Urbanistica topics. Are you ready for a new episode? Let's go for it. I'm looking forward to this episode. It's going to be super interesting and we're going to talk about the importance of daily light and microclimate. So I'm really happy, really excited. And I have the pleasure to welcome Paul Rogers to Urbanistica Podcast. Hey, and welcome, Paul. Yeah, thank you very much. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, thank you. So you're uh, home at the office? I'm in my house in Valley. Nice. Looks very greenery and yeah, um, well, a lot of daylight, uh, a lot of fresh air, and a, a lot of plants. And by the way, thank you so much for giving your time to record this episode. Well, thank you. So, you are our storyteller. How would you like to introduce yourself and tell us about your passion? Uh, I'm an architect who works primarily as a daylight specialist. Uh, I moved to Sweden a little over 20 years ago, but I originate from the Midwestern prairies of Canada. Uh, Just now, I had a group of five daylight certification specialists at a a Swedish architectural firm. Uh, It goes by the name of Biron for Architecture or Urbanism. It's a a very long name, Uh, but they're otherwise known as Bauer Architects. Uh, My little group uh, works not only with Bauer projects, uh, but the majority of our caseload comes externally from developers and other architects. Uh, I should probably also mention that I serve on a number of daylight related committees. I won't go into them. Uh, but I'm also a designated expert uh, on daylight for both the uh, Swan and uh, Environmental Certification System and uh, for Sweden Green Building Council. Uh, but I guess when it gets right down to it, uh, my most important job is as a husband and father. Uh, I have two kids, one age seven and the other nine, and I can say they keep me pretty busy as well. <laughs> I can imagine. So what are you passionate about? Oh. Yeah. Um, it's going to sound maybe a bit odd, <laughs> passionate about the sun and weather uh, and how our interactions with it, uh, with these things shape uh, the way we create our build environments, uh, mostly in terms of light, uh, but also heat as well, uh, both when there's a lack of heat and light, but also when there's too much of these things, uh, because it's very easy to, to swing out of balance there. Uh, I see my job as helping architects and planners achieve balance between these different kinds of energies. And do you think you're on the right country when it comes to daily light? In yeah, very much. I mean, we can talk about it a little more later on. But um, uh, when it comes to lack of daylight, there are a few uh, that a few are as good as uh, Sweden for that. <laughs> How is it back home in Canada? Is it the same situation as here, or no? Not not quite. There's there's about there's only ten degrees latitude. Uh, I'm from a city called Winnipeg, and there's only about ten degrees of latitude difference there. Um, but it's quite profound. You don't get the darkness there that you do here. Um, I don't know where the critical point, I think, is around 55 degrees latitude, and in particular in Europe with, with a lot of cloud cover. I don't think people at home, if I tell them I'm a daylight specialist, they're, they're not really sure why. <laughs> when, I, when, I talk, when I tell the people in the Nordic region, they get it right away. Yeah. Um, it's, always, it's always easier doing the lectures in the winter, uh, I can say, than, than say maybe in, in June. In the winter, I just have to point out the window and go, yeah, there. Okay, let's yeah. let's start. <laughs> let's talk. <laughs> Very interesting. And what do when we say daily light, mm-hmm. what what do we mean by a daily light? What what's in, what's a daily light? Is it natural or is it artificial? Well, the the main thing about daylight is it is natural, 
it's a bit tricky because um, there's a little bit of a difference between how a specialist like myself sees sees the question and how the lay person sees it. Uh, to to a specialist, daylight and sunlight are different things, strangely enough, uh, because that's not how most people perceive them, right? They're, if I give my mom a call in, in Canada and ask her how it is in their living room, she, she describes the general condition. Um, but for some reason, uh, the focus on, on daylight assessment right now is still to look at sort of a diffuse sky on a cloudy day. And that specifically is what we refer to as daylight. When it comes to uh, um, sunlight, it is, it is, of course, the direct beam, you know, when, when, there's, no, when there's no clouds. Um, but I think that um, I don't really think artificial light is, is sort of a different thing, um, particularly when you consider that um, uh, it's not uh, the, the natural light has a, a spectral distribution and an intensity, which is very special. Uh, I don't know if you have you heard of something called circadian lighting. Have you heard that term before? No, actually, actually no. Tell us about okay. it. Well, what the idea is with circadian, because essentially the thing is that um, the main benefits of daylight or the ones that are easiest to prove are uh, have to do with, with the body and, and, and hormones. Uh, it enforces your circadian rhythm or your sleep wake cycle. And it's a little bit that um, it can be a little bit difficult if you don't get the proper amount of daylight to, you know, you're, you're not, your, your sleep quality is, isn't gonna be as good. But so you have a very specific profile, which our bodies are evolved over, you know, I don't know, 100, 200, 300,000 years through the eye to sort of drive this process. and it's sort of very difficult to get that same effect out of an artificial light. Now, the idea behind circadian lighting is that you're going to put in an artificial light that is going to sort of mimic strength and color. Uh, you know, the, the blue lights in the morning to wake you up and then towards the end of the day, shifting more to the reds to make you sleepy. Now, there is some indication that that has an effect, but the science seems to be indicating that uh, and I, I'm not a, a scientist, but uh, if you take it from a, a, a practitioner like me, um, that it seems to indicate that, that it is, in fact, the magnitude of, of daylight which gets the job done. So it's very difficult then to, uh, even though in, in some of the spectral profiles, we can start to approach daylight, just the amount we get from, from natural daylight. So. We have to really watch when we start about talking about replacing daylight with artificial uh, with artificial sources, uh, and in particular with the artificial sources, there's usually a whole lot of energy involved in, in trying to uh, in trying to to make it up, you know. And 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 daylight. I mean, if you look out the window, it's it's coming down for free all around us all the time. So true. Uh, so daily light is something necessary for us humans, not something luxury. As now, when we see different how different houses being marketing okay you got so much daily light yeah well it's it's true that i mean particularly in sweden you know the real estate people have always used this term used or fresh which is uh for non-swedish listeners uh, light and fresh or for our swedish listeners that don't understand my midwest canadian swedish um so light and fresh sort of gets in there and, and it seems to be a real selling point and yeah the it's true the people that have money it usually have very good access to daylight you know they if they if they live either in a villa you know in a well spaced uh, uh, well spaced buildings or they live they live in the inner city they they usually choose to live up high everybody wants the light the light in the view but we can't we don't all have you know we're not all millionaires and we can't all be rich so at the end of the food chain there's somebody's living uh, a little on those bottom floors and in, in the corners and under balconies and and yeah it's it. The risk is if it's not properly um, uh, legislated at minimum level, that it, that it becomes a, a, a bit of a luxury item. Now, there will always be more daylight with more money because it's an attractive feature. But uh, I think we really need to be cautious about how we protect uh, for, for all citizens uh, a regulated uh, minimum level. Yeah. How is the Swedish regulations when it comes to the daily light and the standards? Mm. If you can just brief us. Yeah, um, it's uh, regulated under Chapter 6322 of the Building Code. Um, problem, it dictates a minimum level uh, of daylight per room uh, with something called a uh, daylight factor. 
Now, the main problem with the daylight factor is that it only uh, considers, again, light from the diffuse sky. So it doesn't really have too much to do with, with human perception. It's very difficult to see the difference in a daylight factor, uh, of uh, a slight shift in a, in a daylight factor. Um, it, it's the direct sun that, that so it's a little, I mean, the code hasn't been updated since the mid 70s. And it's curious, but it, it still prescribes uh, a hand method for calculation. It takes, takes about six hours to calculate a room on your, wow. on your first. Uh, now we have something, I don't know if you've heard them called computers. So we have computers now that are, that are much faster, but the code still hasn't really sort of updated that. The preferred method is still the, the hand calculation. So it's a little bit outdated, not only in the way it thinks, but also how how the methods you're supposed to use to, um, uh, to, to, sh to show adequate daylight. But I think one of the major holes for me is the lack of um, provisions for um, existing buildings. Now, the building code does not, um, does not apply to existing buildings. So you have to look at a whole other law structure for that. And it's very fuzzy exactly what the rights are. Um, so at a time when we're, you know, we're densifying our cities and, and people are building next to existing buildings and quite often very fairly, but quite often, maybe not, maybe overbuilding and, and really essentially stealing other people's right to light. Now I use the term right to light uh, in England. Um, there's a, a law since the mid 1800s, an exact date uh, that protects light to ex existing windows. So it's an action. If somebody steals your light, it's it's a legally actionable uh, event. Now, I'm not saying that you know England's got a very different law structure than than we had uh, than we have. So uh, it's just it's clear that the Swedish system is maybe um, um, inadequate for sort of the densities that we're we're looking at today. Um, I was lucky enough to be involved in a in a thesis from uh, KTH uh, that was recently looks at this problem. Uh, it reviews the, what the legislation is. Uh, a, a lot of times I get, I get phone calls from um, building um, permit architects or from um, uh, building inspectors wondering, well, what is it? What are the rules for existing buildings? Uh, and this, this document really, it goes through what, the, what little guidance there is uh, and it also tests them against uh, a number of case studies. So yeah. I, that's my main complaint with the code. Well, actually, all three of those complaints were pretty robust, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I must say that Bovrk is aware of the problem. Uh, that's the Swedish Code Authority. And they are, um, they are working on it. Um, it's not an easy issue anytime you make a code. Um, there's, there's all sorts of unforeseen consequences. So we have to be very careful about that. Yeah. You can't just reinvent it in a day. Um, I'm I'm interested in the in the process behind the scenes of the research that you do in KTH or the project. Would you like to share with us like the method you use? How do you this journey until you're on the conclusion? And yeah, well, I, I'll 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 um if it's if it's research projects you want, I, I've got I think the the main one I would like to mention is the what was called the SBUF existing uh, buildings and. What it, SBUF is an uh, industry-funded um, uh, research initiative. Uh, so obviously it starts with uh, a call for a um, uh, proposal for research, which, which becomes funded. But what, what we were looking at as historically, because when, when we're doing uh, our sort of normal daily work and, and trying to prove uh, that, that a building fulfills the requirements or doesn't, we find that there are a lot of rooms that don't pass. And not only do they don't pass, but they're well under what the legislated amount is. And quite often, actually, these rooms, there's nothing strange about them. There's, there's rooms that you or I would be quite familiar with and, and quite frankly, quite satisfied with. So we started to ask the question, well, what is our cultural expectation in Sweden for, for daylight levels? So we put together uh, about 100, or actually in the end it was 74, we, we cut out a few examples. Uh, so we simulated, uh, so we built up models, we, we got the existing drawings from the archive, we built up the models. We um, uh, then adopted a standard set of, of, of interior uh, reflectances. So, so um, you, or I, you and I are using the same 
type of floor and the same painting on the walls and, and stuff like that. And then we ran these 74 buildings. So it was about 14, 15,000 rooms in the end. And uh, then we analyzed the data. And what we could see, aside from an obvious um, bias towards um, particular time periods, so uh, example, a 50s or a 60s, uh, 40s or 30s building, usually having pretty good daylight, and then trending towards the 80s, uh, late 70s, 80s, and 90s being, being a little darker. Um, but what we found is that we actually don't have historically the level of daylight that was uh, proposed is proposed today by the code. That it that it may in fact be quite unrealistic um, in how it looks at things. So we the the the, the sort of punchline to the thing sort of indicates that well, at the end of the day, we are all of all grown up in places with, with probably a room that that's a little dark and, and maybe that we should be assessing the dwelling on in its entirety and not just room per room. Because quite frankly, I, I don't I don't see any, if, if you've got a, a, a five room apartment with with a light living room and, and, and three light bedrooms, then there's maybe not much harm in having a dark bedroom. Uh, so the suggestion is is that we judge uh, apartments on uh, uh, or housing in general on on it, in its entirety based on the premise that you can move room from room to room and and for the most people for most people that yeah that that is the case <laughs> yeah it's a very very interesting the thing you tell from the 60s 80s the 90s yeah. but i'm thinking who is responsible so the different flats or houses get the daily light is it the architect the municipality, the what do yeah, you think? I think I think highest up on the food chain that that I mean there's maybe six or eight things that, that affect daylight. Uh, the most important is how tightly the buildings are planned. So daylight starts with planning. If I can show you examples that are so tightly planned that it doesn't matter how big the windows are or how uh, if the room is uh, how deep the rooms are, but that, that there's not enough light reaching the facade. So it's really essentially when the architect gets that project, they've inherited the pro they've inherited the problem, a problem that often they can't fix. So foremost, uh, I would say it's the responsibility of the planners, and this is unfortunate because according to the the legislation. It it's to become uh, daylight is reviewed at um, uh, at the start uh, when the building is inspected, and of course it's by far too late then to make any changes. Uh, this was noted also in a in a recent report uh, by a committee for modern building regulations that perhaps it should shift from um, that the owner should shift from the from the uh, building inspector. To the permit architect, but I still that's too late too. That essentially it should be sitting in 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 detail plan. Um, there, there's a number of occasions where we've had projects where we're working, and the detail plan is not yet approved, and we know uh, we know that there are going to be failing rooms, and and maybe to the extent that there are so many failing rooms that the project is at risk of not getting approved, a real risk of not getting approved later down the line. And and it's difficult because quite often at the detail plan you don't meet the you don't meet the building inspector, and you may not even get to meet the permit architect. So it's a bit like putting on a blindfold and, and just sort of running <laughs> and, hope, and hoping for the best. I mean, for the developers, it's it's a, it's a tough situation. Even if they're trying to do you know the best job that they can, you have you have a, a, a situation where as soon as you have a, a closed courtyard. Uh, urban plan that you're going to have rooms that don't pass. It's just a question of how many. But then you don't. You may not be getting the sense of well, what is a, a an acceptable amount uh, later on down the road? And it does vary quite a bit from 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 the municipalities that are commune, as they're called here, from one commune to the next. Um, there's not really a clear guidance uh, on the national level. Uh, which is which is a bit unfortunate. So you believe that planners should take the action and take the lead in, in regulating the, the or ensuring the daily light 
Well, yeah, I mean, we we test for noise. Uh, uh, we test for drainage. We test for, for many other things. So we should be doing daylight in the early phase as well. And Mustafa, it's, it's not difficult at that phase. It's not a, an expensive study. Uh, we've been working some, with something called the VSC or vertical sky component. It's a fancy name. But essentially what it does is it estimates, it's the same calculation that we're going to do in the room, but it estimates the amount of light falling on the facades. So we can see, we can throw in a, a simple massing model and in a couple hours point out, okay, here there's definitely failing rooms and here there's failing rooms and here these rooms are maybe marginal. We'll have to, if you're careful there, you can, you can be okay. But in a few minutes, I can give you, just by looking at one of these diagrams, a, a fairly accurate estimate of how many rooms are not, not going to pass. Now, of course, a lot depends on the architect and the windows and the balcony sizes and the room depth. But we can get a pretty good ballpark figure pretty early. And, and I would sort of throw out there that any planner that's not doing this kind of work right now um, is, is sort of missed the boat by, by quite a bit. And how is it going now? Like you're working in the Swedish market. Do you see that there is a willing in, in considering the daily light already in the early phases in the detailed plan? Yeah, it's, it's starting. Um, Quite often, curiously enough, it comes from the customer or from the developer's initiative that they're, they're proactive. They see that they probably have a problem or they can feel it in their gut and, and they want to do what's reasonable. Um, but um, at the same time, they, they do need a relatively uh, dense project to, to be able to make it economically feasible. And what's wonderful about the VSC is we've shown that it doesn't, it's not anti density at all. In fact, as you move the volumes around, you can find that you can get equal densities or, or higher densities without, um, uh, uh, without sacrificing daylight. It's, it's when you sort of go ahead and you don't even pay any attention to it that, that you, can, you can run in, into a bit of problems. I do occasionally have communes contact me directly uh, in the detail plan. And, and that's always nice. I, I enjoy working with them at, at that phase because Ultimately, you're not locked, you may be in the politics of it to the same degree that, that you are later, later on with, with, uh, with a customer who's, who's, purchasing, uh, uh, who's purchasing land or, or uh, when it's gone a little farther down the road. It's, it's still fresh and there's some flexibility there that, that might not be by the time the developer. And I guess it also affects the, 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 the final result. If you have like a dark space, no one will want to live there. Like if you plan. I think I think we got to be careful about that because I mean people people do have different preferences and 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 my thought is you know you give people a minimum and and allow them to scale it back as they will it's a bit like the volume on your TV um, some will want the volume very high and some will want the volume very low but if you're a little hard of hearing like I am and the volume on the TV is always very low then 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 it doesn't work but I, I don't see any. I don't see any advantage to just restricting it for a whole whole level of of the population. And you also mentioned in the beginning that uh, you're also interested in the heat and the microclimate. So what is a microclimate about? What are the elements that in microclimate? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, you you have in cold climates, and I, I can only really speak about cold climates <laughs> because I, I've always I've always had that. Uh, as my point of reference, um, a, a microclimate is essentially driven by by two motors, and and that's that's the sun, direct sun, and and the wind. Now you can moderate it a little bit with um, your choice of materials, quite a bit. It, it helps, but th without those first two mentioned, that now of course the wind wants a degree of enclosure. It wants to be closed in. Maybe there's a, a cardinal direction there with the wind, a, a dominant direction prevailing westerly. Um, but wind has a habit of swirling around, so the enclosure is usually what it's looking for. But then on the other hand, sun, of course, usually wants it pretty open. Now, what's nice about these two things is 
we know that the sort of the path of the sun is is very specific. Um, so if you open it to the path, of the, you open the space to the path of the sun, then you then you get a, a an interesting, uh, or then you can can get some gain gains there. But it, it's certainly it's not without without those two, then then uh, I think there's a bit of a tendency in 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 the Nordic region to try just go okay a good microclimate lots of sun and and I will try to shelter a bit from the wind but and and I would argue for all microclimates that we have to be looking actually at the scale of say five to twenty meters because on the human scale a very small space that gets sun at a strategic time so for example during lunchtime uh, I think there's a, I think it's called Shopman's Toriet in, in Gamlestan. It's this lovely little s- square, which for the most part is is pretty sheltered, but pretty dark. But there's a sort of 10 by 10 meter patch that gets this little, at the right time of day, around 12 to, to 2 in the afternoon, uh, it gets it gets direct sun. And then, of course, it opens up for all sorts of commercial activities. So for in the Nordic context, I think the idea of, coupling um, um, microclimate to particular functions because we're, we're going to need a degree of shelter but then we solar access is going to be excluded because of that just at certain times so be it an after work uh, or a, uh, a lunch time or um, uh, for daycare you know you're looking at specific times there as well uh, and for park i guess it is, is more general but I certainly think that that we we had done a uh, last year last September we had taken all of the Normand uh, and we uh, in I think it was around September 20th or something we showed where exactly um, you could get an after work drink <laughs> uh, or, or tea we did, that that's an option too uh, uh, so where all the patios were that had sun uh, later in the day so you didn't have to go looking around you could just sort of look at the map. And that's a sort of strategic coupling, but that's I think how it works here. But I, I'm interested to hear your perspective because I know you've had a lot of uh, experience with warmer climates, and and just about anything you can tell me will increase yeah. what I so. Well, uh, yeah, sure. There's a lot to talk about, but like it's completely the opposite of the Nordic countries. Uh, I'm from Iraq, from the Middle East, and we we don't like the sun really yeah. so much, <laughs> and we always trying to hide from the sun, and we try to maximize. The darkness inside like indoors because the time you go out there you got the enough mo- amount of uh, you know sunlight so um, yeah for us it's um, we're trying to close the like it's the windows are less uh, when it comes to the the size and also we try not to have this open areas try to close it as much as possible by like uh, playing with the volumes of the of the buildings and trying always to shadow with the umbrellas big umbrellas or what you call it public spaces we don't have really like strong relation to public space because usually public mm-hmm. space is very very hot winter time we enjoy it but usually if you go to the some countries on middle east during the daytime you see the city em- almost empty yeah and yeah. because everyone is at home trying to <laughs> to survive, you know. The sun dominates, but in a totally different. I mean, exactly. it must be very strange for you to try to to try to talk to your friends about the lack of daylight. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it was interesting. Also, when when I did my master, we were discussing because here totally the opposite. Here, people just want to see the sun, want to be outside <laughs> to enjoy. And there we have a, a, another story. And uh, yeah, so the, this is basically the, our relation i can as a as a user of the city as a mm. part of the city not as a light designer or researcher but this is how we how i experience the the city trying always to hide from the sun uh, mm. okay, let's say buildings uh, or flats with the as dark as possible they get sold quickly and uh, yeah this is but, our but story the time of day really experiences dictates how you experience the city yeah. So for for us, if I I go back to the to my country, for us enjoying the city, going out, walking, it starts uh, when it's almost the sunset. Mm-hmm. Then the weather is more beautiful. I'm talking more about when uh, not winter time, but the other seasons. Yeah. After uh, 6 p.m., we start then to to go out to walk, 
and so on. But all the other time, like the morning, we try to avoid going out in the city. Is it in the winter? Then it's normal for us in the winter because usually no, our winter is fine. The sun is not really strong mm. and the, the, the weather is a bit cold. So it's a really good balance. So then we, we, we are fine. I think it's so funny. I mean, the, the thing is, like when, it's, when the sun is out there, there's about three times the light that there is here in the summer. Uh, and so it's, there's a real, there's an intensity there. And then of course the shadows are so sharp. They're, they're basically straight down here. We've got these, these extremely long shadows. I always yeah. think it's funny here how even in the summer, you can sit at noon and it can be sunny. You, you can sit at noon in a jacket in the sun. Because <laughs> there's just there's just not much yeah. much strength in it. Uh, and, now there's certain days when the temperature is warm, but I think actually the last week in Stockholm's been a good example where it's been about 18 degrees, and uh, you often see people sitting on the on the patios uh, in the full sun with it with a jacket on, and that's really remarkable. And I, again, yeah. I get back to the the Nordic sun; it, it's quite different than I mean, not the least of which is its solar angles are always hitting you in the face and causing glare, um, which is quite different sort of than the glare that you might experience where, where it's a reflected glare coming from below. Yeah. But when I think of warm countries, I often think of these sort of marvelous screens that, that give a, a diffuse light, uh, a control, uh, and, and often sort of different levels. So uh, in at least in traditional architecture where your eyes can adjust as you move in sort of these different levels of, mm. of, of natural light then into the, more yeah. I've never been. I've never been in, in, in any of those buildings. Which yeah, is... hopefully, hopefully after the COVID nineteen, we can take a visit and so you can experience. So then you have the full experience of the Nordic and the and the warm yeah. countries. Yeah. I, I must say, like I'm where I'm come from. There's uh, this uh, Winnipeg in in Canada. It's, it has a a very wide temperature range. So I grew up with with weeks. Well, not, not weeks, but it's not uncommon to get a week where the where it's minus thirty. Um, much colder than the the warmest the warmest winter I have had here is still uh, sorry the coldest winter I've had in Stockholm is warmer than <laughs> is warmer than the warmest winter I have had in Winnipeg. But yeah. then the funny thing happens there is during the summer, you know the temperatures shoot up and it gets over thirty quite a bit hotter than in Stockholm. So the wind is also a, an issue and. You can even get like wide temperature variations from one day to the next. So you can have a plus 30 a couple of days after having a, a minus temperature. Yeah. So I sort of, it's, it sort of imprinted itself in my, in my mind, these kind of how, how weather can really shape yeah. because the types of activities you do in, in those different times. It's, your life is entirely different. Yes, exactly. And uh, now I remember a really fun story. When we moved to Sweden, so my parents had really difficulties to adjust to the to the sun and the amount of hour of daily sun. Because here, the sun almost never sets if you're in the north and yeah. sometimes. So my parents, they had really difficulties to, to sleep. So yeah. were their bi biological, what do you call it, uh, clock or... Uh, or yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were buying a very black textile and just putting it on the window. Yeah. So it was it was very hard experience. Yeah. Yeah. There's one thing that, you know, there's approximately the same amount of sunlight hours in everywhere. I mean, we've got an extended, we've got a little plus because we're always sort of getting these extended dawns. Like, as you know, in the more southerly latitude, when the, when the sun drops, bang, it's, it's, it's done. Yeah. But we, in, in the Nordic countries, we miss so much of it. Like the sun's a bit antisocial. It's, it's sleeping while we're awake and vice versa. <laughs> so we sleep through like a lot of these sunlight hours. We've got, we've got, when you compare our waking hours to the, when you try to overlap them, it's, 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 we get fewer in, in the end. So it's a bit of a problem child. The, the sun is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I say, you throw that in with the glare that often when it is, you know, it's hitting you in the face, you got to put the blind down. True. Uh, so it, it's, it's yeah. a different context. I, I, I want also to ask, you about the uh, thing a smart city I'm, in this podcast i'm talking a lot and exploring what is a smart city so now when it comes to light in the future we can we are able to to generate uh, sustainable energy to run artificial lighting and so do you believe that we can build like denser 
and by uh, artificial lighting, then we can balance the situation. What, what's your reflection about this? Again, I don't think we can replace the access to, to direct sun and, and natural light, um, at least in, again, in the, in the Nordic context. Now, um, having said that, it, assuming if, if you could have a sustainable energy source, um, I look at these um, uh, heat lamps that are often used on outdoor and outdoors. And I mean, it's a tremendous waste of energy, but I understand the huge value. People want to be outdoors. Is they want to extend their outdoor season. And um, I, I, on the one hand, I, I like the public life that it gives. Um, but on the other hand, it's a tremendous waste of energy. So if you could find a, a way to, to power those heat lamps, uh, then I think it's it's a wonderful idea to to try to to anytime you can better the climate of the streets um, is is a good thing. But we can't lose track. I mean, those interventions are going to be uh, relatively weak compared to what what the sun should do. We should never use it as a replacement. We we could maybe support and and supplement when when there is no sun. Uh, or, but um, to, to to I think those are almost different questions. You know, do we first question is, do we have adequate access to, to natural light and, and, and heat? Um, after that, we can say, well, how can we help it? How can we supplement it? But I think the main driver is, is the access to the real thing. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what is our biggest challenge here? Let's say we, we can talk about Stockholm because we are here or, or maybe it's the same challenge in other cities here in Sweden when it comes to the daily light. The biggest challenge, uh, of, of course, is is density, um, but there there are other issues as well. Like we need to meet building code regulations on energy, and of course that is looking for thicker floor plates. It's probably restricting your window sizes. Um, there's a number of factors there with energy that you coat the windows now. Uh, an old an old window uh, maybe had a light transmittance of. 85 percent so uh, of the light that that reached that window 85 percent got through and now standard for housing is around 67. so those are some of the challenges that the energy it's good to save energy uh, i'm all about that um but at the same time we have to recognize that that some of the measures there uh, do restrict our access to light there's uh, some wonderful regulations uh, for sound um and again sound often wants but daylight doesn't. It wants to be closed in. It wants maybe a big balcony or an extra pane of glass. So all these things together sort of create this, the energy regulations and, and the sound and, and the density create sort of a, a vortex against, <laughs> against daylight, which, which, which is a bit of a challenge. But I think there's, although people, I think, recognize it, its importance in where they live, probably been a little slow and it's not until the last five years that people have begun to realize that that it is actually an important factor that it's a key thing it's a key part of indoor a good indoor environment uh just like fresh air or or absence of uh guaranteeing that there's no molds or or uh, uh, or things like things like that so um it, it's it's been a bit of a challenge but i think things are getting um there's a Things are getting better in, in many ways as people realize that this is something that needs to be looked at in, at the early stages and, and, and taken seriously. We've, we've seen some very dark apartments, I can say. Um, but um, in, in the beginning, uh, they would maybe not get approved by the, by the building inspector. But as the building inspectors have become more savvy and have educated themselves, uh, we see there's a couple of commune uh, or municipalities that are particularly uh, savvy uh, and well read, and um, really, um, they they may be perceived as a little strict, but at the same time, they 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 have set the agenda to what they think is acceptable, and and they have the um, the experience now to start backing it up. And of course, we have communes that are just starting out and, and maybe a little afraid to to take the stand, um, but. It, it varies, like I said, it varies much from commune to commune. And that's one of the things is I've been fortunate enough to have a, a pretty big caseload. I mean, we get between 85 to 100 new projects externally every every year. And I've had that over the last five years. So 
you, we gain a little bit of experience with these communes yeah. to know, okay, how do they work? What are their philosophies? Um, some of them you may agree with more than others. Um, some of them uh, you might want to see a little more ambition. Um, but uh, all in all, it's, ultimately, it's not my job to decide what is what is permissible. That's that's their job. My job is is, is to try to uh, to reach uh, and to understand what they believe is permissible and to deliver and deliver projects. Yeah. They can but tell me, is it a big deal for, let's say, take uh, small uh, municipalities to educate themselves about the light and integrate it with the process? Does it cost so much or no? <laughs> I can say I, I was in the habit of going out to a lot of the communes on my own on my own time. Uh, or to be fair enough, um, um, that uh, Bao, uh, my my employer, took the time and would, would donate a couple hours because it's important that the system functions properly. It's a very dangerous situation if if they're if they're interpreting rules that they don't understand. So it's not uncommon that um, the the demand became a little bit much. So now there's a standard fee, but. I mean, for for five or six thousand kroner, you you get a lecture of uh, an hour, an hour and a half. Um, but I'm always but I'm always interested in taking a call. I'll put it to you that way. I can uh, you're gonna have trouble getting me off this episode. I talk to you <laughs> hours, so you'll have to uh, you'll have to hang up on me at the end. But the same goes for communes. Like I'm always glad if if one yeah. contacts me, and because that's how you that's how you learn. Uh, and and the more that's that's I'm aware of what's going on. The I think the better practitioner I am. Yeah, yeah, that's great to hear that. And now, Paul, you will go to Urbanistica time machine. You will go back in time, and you're allowed to change one thing from architecture, urban planning, and design perspective. What will you change? Yeah, I would go back uh, ten years ago when the real densification of Sweden started. Um, you know, there's a tendency to think that densification is happening in the center of Stockholm and Gothenburg, but that's not at all the case. I mean, there are some very dense areas being made in, in the smaller centers, uh, um, beyond shipping, knee shipping. Um, there, there's obviously an economic component to that. But um, I think had we, had we spent a little more time in testing forms, to allow for you know, the same density, but better um, improved daylight. I think we'd, we'd be better off. Um, I know you've had Spacemaker on the show. Um, how would you describe them? Well, uh, it was it was interesting. I that test, testing different models before. I mean, just modeling the different scenarios. I, I think it's important that we, we, we put the time, we give the time. I know time costs money. But at least we have the different scenarios to to see which one is the, the the best, which one is the worst case scenario. Instead of just like going with one scenario and trying to work on it, and maybe there is a, a another perfect scenario waiting for us, but we didn't look at it. So I think this the I think the idea of space maker, I, I believe in it as help for, for the planners and architects. What do you yeah. think? I've worked I've worked with them to help them develop the daylight module. Um, they sort of patterned it a little bit after the way we've worked. And I think that's the sort of, you know, it can be space maker, it can be another product, a, uh, artificial, uh, what is it called? Augmented AI, whatever that is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, artificial intelligence, thank you. Um, it can be another product, that, or you can write your own script in Grasshopper. But, but damn it, you got to be testing and, and, and checking and, and seeing the fallout from these decisions. Because people at the end, I mean, they, they have to live there. So that's what I would have liked to have seen is some is some start uh, and, and just looking at, at basic daylight access. Now, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, I'm not, I'm not that much against, I mean, it's okay to have an area with, with maybe less daylight access, but you, you shouldn't be surprised at the end. And that's, I think, one of the things that frustrates me is, is you know down the road everyone's like, oh wow you know it, it it was really bad with daylight and people can't get permits or they, or they can't get their uh, the inspector to approve it but I mean they should you should have known the tools are out there you know and, and so I go back to you're kind of as a planner you're kind of remiss if you're not carrying out these tests 
to, to get a basic idea of, well, what is the daylight access? Now, they can still, the architect can still blow it with a, with a small window. And it, it's very, as I said, it's very easy to fail the, the BBR, but it, it, we, have to, we have to sort of keep it under control a little bit by knowing what's going on. And I always say, well, you know, is it an elephant or a chihuahua? Like, we want to know that before we go in, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think it's worth to, it's not, I don't know why developers not investing in this in, in daily light in the early phases and then they struggling in the end. Yeah. Well, I think I think it just caught everybody by surprise because we hadn't built to those densities before and we didn't have the strict energy requirements that are coming now. So it, it caught everybody off guard. Yeah. Yeah. And if you go to the future with the same time machine, what will you add to all the cities on this planet? What what would I add? Oh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I can answer that. That's that's that one's a little over my head. Um, I'm just I'm just a basic practitioner. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to pass on this question? Yes. Okay, great. Well, I, I'm really happy to be honest because I didn't study the lighting and daily light and during my master program and other programs in in the different academia universities, and now I feel that. There is a big need, especially for me as an urban planner, that I need to talk to someone expert in the daily light. And uh, yeah, so thank you so much again for giving your time, and hopefully, see you in the future in, in the project. Yeah, that that would that would be great. I, there's, I'm I'm not alone in doing this. It's it's it. We were one of the first to to bring it up, and and we have a a, a book where we were showing. Um, as a reference guide, uh, daylight access in existing Swedish neighborhoods, ones that we all know, um, um, Hammerby Hostad and, and, and Gamla Stan and in areas where, where we know as, as a reference guide. But I've noticed now that many architects are, are carrying out these studies and uh, it's, it's, it should be very commonly done. I mean, it's yeah. not hard. Yeah. Well, Paul, it was... Very inspiring to talk to you. How would you like to, to summarize what we talked about, your reflections and three takeaway messages to all Urbanistica listeners? Yeah, um, if, I can, if I can just do three messages. Um, I, think, I think the thing is to start early with, in the planning phase, but it has to go through the entire process. You can't they figure you fixed it in the planning phase and then, then it's a good start. But there has to be testing and, and, and such all the way through. And then I also want people not to lose track of, of existing buildings. What I mean by that is when you're building a project, what happens to the people who are, who are besides or who, who live next door? And I would, I would guess that those, there are probably more of those people than living in, in new buildings. And the final takeaway, all I would say was, you know, um, if anybody has questions or, or just wants to talk daylight, please give me a call. I think I think my wife's had enough talking daylight at home. So uh, <laughs> anybody I can get on, on the line, I'm glad to. Glad Wonderful. To yeah. Thank you so much. And three hashtags. Yeah. Um, let's say daylight, sunlight, and microclimate. That's yes. it. Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much again. Yes. Thank you, Mustafa. And hopefully see you in the future in a project or interesting episode about interesting topics. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. I'm enjoying your podcast. So keep up thank the you. good. Thank yeah. you so much. And yeah. thank you so much for listening to Urbanistica podcast. Please, if you have a great story that makes our city smarter, please contact me, follow on Instagram, subscribe the YouTube channel. Urbanistica is being produced in collaboration with Landscape Slugget that's working with Landscape Architecture, Urban Planning and Design based in Stockholm. I am Mustafa Sharif. Keep up the good work. Keep loving cities. <laughs>